Good day and welcome to our weekly ENCA live debate. I'm your host, Trudy Makaya. Today we turn our gaze to the catwalk, to the runway, to the fashion industry. And we ask, is the fashion industry fabulous or is it bust? I'm joined by Anthony Bila, um, who's sitting on my right. He's a visual artist, a self-confessed creative <laughs> prostitute. <laughs> he is a sculptor. He's also a writer, as I said, a visual artist. And he will be helping us think about art and trends and how this all affects uh, fashion. On my left, I'm also joined by Sonra Bilen Damase, who's the executive director uh, executive president rather of South African Fashion Designers Association and to his left uh, we have Ntlantlan Niza who is the creator of NN Vintage. I also believe that she dabbles in the music industry once in a while so we'll talk about that too. Um, we're between two fashion weeks um, at the moment. Uh, over the weekend, we had the Mercedes-Benz Fashion Week, and next week we'll have um, South African Fashion Week. And so we asked, despite all of this activity and all of this creativity and beautiful clothes um, coming onto our runways, how many designers actually stay the distance and make it and compete in the local market and globally? We're told from statistics that only about a third of what South Africans wear is made locally. So we don't wear our own. And the question is, why is this the case? And is it, is it bad? And is this something that should be changed? Uh, when we look at low end fashion, we import a lot from countries like China, Vietnam, even Bangladesh. On the high end, we look to Paris, New York, Milan, Rome. And there isn't much space for Johannesburg, Durban, Bloemfontein, Muslagen in all of this. Um, so I'm going to ask my panel, with this diverse heritage that we have in this country, why are we not seeing it translate into a very vibrant and robust fashion industry and creative industries in general? I'm going to start with Ntlantla, um, who, you know, as most people would know, um, is also part of um, Afiki Zolo. And I'm going to ask, um, you showed a collection uh, at this uh, Mercedes-Benz uh, Fashion Week that's just behind us. Can you tell us, just tell us your journey towards that, um, towards building up a label to the point where you're able to show what has been the journey like, what are the struggles in getting there? Um, the journey has been, has been a difficult one because um, you know, it's not easy to actually get finance when you start out um, as, a, as, a, as a designer. So everything that I did when I launched um, my fashion label, I had to pay everything from my own pocket, um, which was very, very difficult, you know, um, because I've got, I've got a family, I'm a family woman, and now you know, I've got this business um, that was starting out. So um, it, was, it was very difficult um, to get you know, to where um, I wanted it to get to. Um, I, I employed people that needed to be paid. I had a place that needed to be paid every month. So you can just imagine you know, um, um, the pressure, um, but I suppose, uh, you know, when you're doing something that you love, something that you're passionate about, you, you know, you focus on that, you put your focus on that. And um, that's what I did. So it's been a very um, difficult, but right now I feel like um, it, it, it's kind of like now uh, a rewarding journey, you know, after showcasing for the very first time in such a big platform at the Mercedes-Benz Fashion Week, um, and the response um, that I got, I felt like, you know, all of these years, all of this hard work that I've been putting into this um, is, is finally, you know, seeing the light is finally paying off. Hmm. Yeah. So it's finally paying off. I mean, it's interesting listening to you because, of course, you are a well-known brand. And yet, despite that, you still struggled um, to get financing, which... So imagine someone who's simply coming straight from, you know, mm. um, Technicon or uh, just is inspired to be working just from their kitchen and trying to make it. Um, it seems like it would even be that much harder. Uh, so Nabile, you have been involved in the industry for a long time. You've you hosted the Vugani um, Fashion Awards um, for a, a few decades now. D do you see growth in this industry? Is it changing? Is it becoming more dynamic? Or is it the same struggles over and over again? I, 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 I could say that um, since the beginning of um, the struggle in this particular industry, uh, especially in the 
in, in, in the craft, especially in the creative um, uh, discipline, it's been a struggle. Um, we actually, at the, those years in the 80s and 90s, where we managed to go, I mean, in New York, we managed to go into all those particular platforms, trying to say South Africa has arrived. It is time for the African child to be reckoned with in the international arena. Now, you do that on these international platform. And the challenge is one is that when then you come back home, as much as you have showcased internationally, you have been identified internationally as an emerging market for economical growth, you find that when you come in back into your country, you find that you're back to the square one. The reason is that you find that your institution, um, like your DTI, your, your IDC, and so forth and so forth, the entry there, it's so bureaucratic. And uh, it takes and one. And they should be helping with financing, They should be marketing. helping with the faculty. But what they do, you know, before they had an EMI scheme, which then for going international, they will create that market for you to say, go in and showcase. Go in and uh, display your product. But when you come back, you say, these are the orders. These are mm -hmm. interest. Now I need to make it a point that my my, my, my creative market or my ma manufacturing can be assisted. You find that they are not there on that. You have to start again as if you are the first hmm. in, the ro in the two. It's almost like a wedding marriage analogy. They're there for the wedding. They put up a good show, but then to sustain the whole to thing. To sustain the whole thing is not there. Difficult. Yeah. So that is what has been. I mean, then now we came up with the seed, I mean, with the CETAs as well that have come into the four, your FPNM CETA, which is fiber manufacturing and processing CETA, which then they've come now into the party to make it a point that they assist and help these young and upcoming designers so that they can have the skills and also the manufacturing sector to come into the party. That's what happened in Europe. We, when then we go there, we have seen some of the huge labels that are being um, launched. For example, in the case of Nchandla, as what she's saying, what would have expected in the industry, one is that the industry, the manufacturing sector, before you launch your line, you first align yourself with the, manufacturer, with the fabric manufacturers. Manufa fabric manufacturers, they come into the party because you are talking about volumes that people are going to buy. Then at the end, you have the manufacturing, which is now the, the machinery and everything that in the factory that is going to come into the party. So that at the end of the day, you don't carry the whole burden on your, because, own. On your own. Because now I guess that in at the end, she has to run around again and market and, and go out there and promote and go out there and do all those things by herself, whereby then, after this platform have been created, they're supposed to give you that supportive system. Okay. I think we'll get back to the manufacturing value chain and, and delve deeper into that. But let's, let's stick with the art uh, uh, for, for a moment. Um, Anthony, you block at um, the expressionist, or you are the expressionist, and you're quite embedded in the street style, um, yeah. loosely said. Um, you also talk about how, as an artist in general, you align yourself to abstract expressionism, cubism, yeah. all very um, Western um, art movements. And I wonder, where is our, let's call it, uh, you know, post-Afro-chic futurism? You yeah. know, what, what are the movements coming from our streets? Um, do we have local idioms, or are we forever always looking towards the West for our creative inspiration? Well, I mean, first we have to flip that on its head and remember where all of these art forms, even Cubism, Picasso drew inspiration from Africa. So on the flip side of the coin is that it, it actually originated in Africa. But uh, my philosophy is this, because of my generation, Generation X, the Millennials, whatever you want to call us, we have been influenced not just by books and what our parents have taught us, but by the internet. The internet for a lot of young people has even replaced God. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, as controversial as that might sound, but it's, it's what's happened. Instead of praying when you wake up or going to sleep, young people are checking Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. 
and uh, and you tell me that's not a god to those young people so in that instance we are influenced by africa in itself but by the world also and it's the reason why my blog the expressionists the the mantra really is to bring africa to the world and the world back to africa and um, the nice thing about the internet is that it's democratized access to information so whereas in the past events like fashion week were very exclusive and for a certain echelon of people and a certain lifestyle and uh, financial background the internet has democratized that where things like street style have begun to influence the fashion weeks rather than the fashion weeks influencing the day-to-day -day fashion. But what has it democratized? Has it democratized yeah. the access that we can all now be observers um, in a global conversation or has it democratized also production that we can produce and also have African or South African well, or, both. you know, our cities reflected yeah. on, on that arena? Well, it's done both things because on the one hand, you're not limited to having to showcase at Fashion Week if you don't have the resources to pay 20, 30,000 Rand to showcase. You can build up a brand and that's how I did it with my personal brand. Um, I didn't have the access to uh, exhibitions and galleries because, you know, there's a certain political bureaucratic process to get into those into those fields so I just put it on the internet and like Vianney was saying because it was on the internet and I consistently put out a certain level of work um, brands in the UK in Berlin in Paris saw the interest and uh, ironically I got more interest overseas than I did locally and it's almost like only when you've been recognized <laughs> internationally you become okay. legitimized locally so it's almost like a, a prodigal son situation but to answer your question the the access to the internet has has done what the past couldn't and that's give everybody an opportunity to at least get a foot in the door and uh, and from that point influence um, if your work is of a higher standard Okay, so it's it's flattened in in some ways the the playing field. Oh, um, you'll see, um, we have um, uh, a lady who's been very quiet <laughs> so far uh, on 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 the extreme right. Erin um, Bates uh, is our social uh, media uh, manager for today, and she will be bringing the voice of the community into this conversation. Uh, people are talking to us on Twitter, they have questions. And uh, wh what are they saying? What are their concerns? What, what's top of mind? Yeah, just to start off with, we do have the Twitter hashtag, hashtag ENCA Live. So anybody who's interested in participating can use that. Um, just following up on what Anthony said about online, about consumerism around African fashion, certainly in terms of your, your show in Tlantla, there was a barrage of praise, tweets, beautiful images of your work that were doing the rounds on social media so it really reflects what Anthony was talking about in terms of in terms of the online community talking in terms of questions for today we've had um, we've had some great response so far and we welcome more so please use the hashtag ENCA live um, here's one question that maybe Trudy you can facilitate an answer for the question is is it true that we use African prints made in China to create our designs how is that allowed Ah, okay, that's a, that's a tough <laughs> one. Maybe we'll start with you <laughs> uh, being the veteran uh, in the industry. So, Namile, what is the situation with fabrics and prints? What's been happening is that we have been, if ever then I might use the word that was used to my learned colleague <laughs> on that extreme, <laughs> we have been prostituted by this international arena. They come and steal our designs. Okay. They come and steal our motives. And after they've done that, they go back and manufacture those and bring them back in a fabric. It could be a fabric. It could be any kind of an art. Guess what? Because I know that kind of uh, artistic or that kind of a design, what I will do, I will buy it because I can identify with the same as Ndebele art form, the same as Tosa, the same, all these different cultures that we do have. It is because sometimes we as South Africans, we have not yet gone back into our own roots and utilize what we have and protect it internationally as well before it gets out there and being used. Yes, of course, China then comes in. We had companies like Vlisco Fabrics as well that were from Holland. Then they came in as well and take these aesthetics and these designs. And then they go with them and then guess what? When they bring them back, it's patent now already. Mm. It's got their 
a signature on the bottom. It's no more a South African. Now, guess what? A South African comes in and claim an African part of it. And guess what? You are already now feeding back. You become a consumer. You are not a manufacturer. You are not creating of any kind of a job. Hmm. And Lanza, what's been your, your experience with um, things like fabrics and um, sourcing? Um, basically, what I've been doing is, um, especially for this particular collection that I've just showcased, um, I've, been, I've been buying fabrics from all over, where we've been going as Mafiki Zolo going to perform. Um, I got fabrics from um, Ghana, Uganda, Nigeria, um, Kenya. So I've been basically collecting fabrics from, you know, from all over the continent. And, um, and, and because this particular showcase, I wanted to showcase what we have, you know, as, as I wanted to produce a proudly South African um, um, product, you know, and, and really that was um, uh, my aim for this, for this, for this um, collection. But um, I think, you know, um, um, like what he's saying, um, it's, 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 I think for, for new designers, um, designers that are still emerging like myself, we don't know, um, you know, really what happens behind the scenes. We don't mm -hmm. really know um, where the fabric was manufactured. You just go there and you think, oh, this is an it African fabric, good. so yeah. I'm going to buy it. I'm supporting an African brother. But you don't really know what happened and where it was manufactured and all of that. And that is really, really important. Okay, we'll pick up on that when uh, we come back. We're going to take a short break um, and where we can also have, still have the conversation on Twitter, on Facebook, on social media, and we'll bring it back uh, into the studio. Um, so we heard about the challenges, uh, but we also have people like Ntlandla who in a way are creating a pan-African and also proudly South African brand. And so stay with us as we continue this conversation after this short break. This week on ENCA Live, we turn our gaze to the runway. People come here for our wildlife and they come here for, for our cuisine and our arts and culture. And, and fashion offers a wonderful opportunity because people from all over the world are attracted to fashion. I have seen the interest amongst young people. It's an opportunity to job create in many ways when you have the, the showcases. It's also an opportunity to, to develop young talent in South Africa who are interested in fashion. South Africa we're known for beads and everything else but not literally African beads you know it's like let's make it global it took years of knocking at IMG getting that appointment and presenting my look uh, my press book and being interviewed excruciating interview people think it just happens overnight and like yes we like you come through I want them to to know this brand David Lally one made in South Africa designed by a South African designer um, with uh, beautiful aesthetics from South Africa. With such a rich and diverse cultural heritage, what will it take for South African fashion to make its mark here and abroad? Is the industry obsessed with fabulosity at the expense of business sense or too obsessed with international trends to develop a local idiom? <laughs> So since we're talking about fashion, I'm going to take the liberty and tell you that today I'm wearing Amanda Led Sherry. Um, it's a dress I bought uh, years ago at the space. Um, and so a little, my little contribution um, towards supporting uh, local fashion. And so I'm going to go around and ask everyone who they're wearing. I'm going to start with you, Ntlandra. Um, this is my own creation and in vintage. Yeah, um, I, I actually just pulled it out of the collection. And okay, yeah, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm known for the Madiba shirts, right. which I created and invented from the beginning. This is part of what I've done, which is just only a 
easy, but now what is happening is that more available, more to, available. The, to the masses. So as you can see, if it doesn't have this Vukani, it's not the true Madiba shirt. Oh, now this we didn't know. I think you're going to have to break this down <laughs> a little bit. So you're saying you invented the Madiba? Or yes, of course. I started the Madiba shirt before they become famous. Okay. And then I suppose other people picked it up from there. Definitely, yes. Okay, uh, but you're saying we should watch out for the, the Vugani. Watch out for this particular label. If it doesn't have this, that's not a true Madiba shirt. Okay, we learned something new today. <laughs> well, Anthony, I mean, what uh, are you wearing? I'm, I'm going to be the, Who are you wearing? The, Sorry. the thorn amongst the roses. Because <laughs> I'm wearing uh, Ben Sherman, Eleven Paris, and I think Topman. Which are wow. all which are all overseas brands, but in my defence, I do buy local young designers. It just so happens today, I'm wearing all foreign clothes. <laughs> tweet. <laughs> it happens. Ah, <laughs> tweet on the tweets. <laughs> Aaron, should we ask you what you? Yeah, you should, because I'm <laughs> yes. in the same boat as Anthony. Oh. I'm afraid, um, but I am wearing Mr. Price pants, so I, I think that counts for something, because often their clothes are assembled in South Africa, even if the fabrics are produced overseas. My shoes are from Cotton On, and so is my top. Yeah, I must say shoes is one area where we struggle because when I looked in my wardrobe, it was very easy for me to pick up um, a South African dress. But shoes, mm. um, I, I don't, I don't think I have any locally made or a local uh, brand of, of shoes. So that's perhaps an opportunity <laughs> for yeah. someone to to come in. We're talking about creativity and obviously fashion and. A lot of this is about ideas, really. I mean, it's part of cultural production in many ways. You know, f you know, you can look at fashion, music, photography. They kind of come from the same place. And that place is often protected by intellectual property laws. Um, the idea that you can't copy um, someone else's creation and, and sell it as your own um, or, or not acknowledge um, that you've taken something. You know, in literature or in writing, it would be simply, or even in any other art form, it would be plagiarism. And so we have this situation, um, um, perhaps an elephant in the room in any discussion about fashion around Gavin Raja, where once again, a creation of his is alleged, he hasn't really said much in his defense either way, but it's alleged to have been uh, copied uh, this time from a British designer. There was another incident a few years ago with a creation from a Le Lebanese designer. And so uh, I want to ask our panel, is plagiarism a real problem? We've heard about a different kind of plagiarism where internationals tap into our resources but don't acknowledge us. But do we have the same problem within the industry of people copying each other and also, I suppose, in this case, potentially copying international um, trends. I'll start with you, Ntlantla. Um, you know, like you said, that it has happened even, even with music. Um, there are laws that protect um, such, but it's, 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 it's quite tricky because even the laws, they do give you, um, they do allow you to reproduce something and change it a bit. It does allow you to do that, which becomes quite tricky. Um, but I mean, uh, you know, yes, I was about to say music I, sampling. There's a lot of sampling yes, that happens that yes. seems to be I okay. mean, uh, the, the instance um, that happened with, for instance, um, last year with, um, you know, um, um, Zahara's song. And people heard that in Beyonce's song, there was, it, it, it was sampled from some of the beats from Zahara's song. Um, but like I said, you know, there's, there's, it, it, it's quite a thin line, you know, for, 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 for a person to come and say, um, you stole my song. As long as there's just a little bit of change, the court would rule that, um, no, it's, it's not the same. You know, it's, it, it actually um, applies with the designs as well. I think it's because we're in the creative industry. And um, I know that in my, in my case, it, had ha it has happened a lot of times whereby, um, you know, a songwriter would write almost the same thing I was thinking, you know, mm. almost the same. Okay. You know, it happens, it, it, it doesn't happen more often, but it's something that does happen. So, um, you know, I don't know the case with, with what happened with Gavin Raja, but I would say, you know, um, it, it's, 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 it's quite tricky in, in the creative industry. It's quite tricky. Um, I think you can, you can yeah. elaborate. No, I see what you mean, that there yeah. is a line between you can have, we in the same, we're consuming the same media, consuming yes. the same things. We might be influenced the same ways and perhaps that, that seeps into our work. Um, Sonovile, any take on this? Well, definitely, yes. Um, they say, there's a say which I can just only indulge from what uh, Ntlantla is saying. 
what you're thinking about somebody else is doing something about it. Mm. There's that say out there. Mm. But neither to say, you know, in our creative space, there's always, because sometimes, like I was saying, the availability of the fabric as well, where then you cannot have a particular rights on t certain types of fabrics. And then also there's what we call in terms of, because when you have to go and patent mm. that in the clothing, because you have to start it from the fabric and go through the design and identify all the items that are going to say, this is yours. But moving beyond that, um, fashion has, this is what we call a block, block pattern, okay. which then it comes up when you are looking for one would say a shirt is a shirt. Mm. There's a block pattern for the shirt, there's a block pattern for any, for the dress and so forth and so forth. But then there's what we call manipulation. Okay. Now it's when then how you manipulate that block pattern in creating whatever that you are doing. In the case of what has now happened, but designers have to understand that, like my learned colleague was saying, today you cannot think that it's still the old times, whereby I could just only steal your design mm. as is and just <laughs> only change the fabric and think that people, a client's actually are stupid to not catch mm. up with that because everything now is on the net. You cannot fool them. It's the same as a magazine, whereby when a client gives, comes to me and said, you know what, there's this beautiful design. It's designed by Ntlandla, but Ntlandla is not close by. I'm in Durban, yeah. but I saw it on television. Therefore, <laughs> can you do it for me? There is that as well. Then you find that I go and look for a cheap fabric, if ever, then I'm a dressmaker, mm. and do that particular item of Ntlantla. And guess what's happening? Ntlantla is here, but because it's not protected in Durban, cannot go and find out that all my designs, like now, she showcased in that. Whilst she was showcasing on that particular platform, everybody has the camera, I mean, have, have yes. a phone yeah. and everything. And those things are not bad when you are getting there to say, listen, we don't need no cell phone, no what, what, when you are getting in, because automatically, now people were tweeting hair design immediately. When they were doing that, it's also plagiarism because you are getting this without the permission of the owner of that particular design or mm. design. It's already there in the space. And guess what? Everybody is now at liberty to utilize that. Mm. Now, what rights that stands with her to protect herself from that, especially mm. on those kind of, uh, now you again depend on the loyal clients that will come back to know, to yes. know they say, no, I want my shirt from the Sonwabila, the yeah. original Madiba shirt. I don't want it from any other second hand, any other person. I want it from Sonwabila because I know Sonwabila is the designer of the Madiba shirt. That's when then you start because of our laws in the country as okay. well, and not that much. So, Anthony, I mean, this has been happening since the beginning of time. I mean, even in, in painting, there's a whole industry about authenticating yeah. the, the works of the great masters to make sure that, um, you know, we don't have fakes. But, I mean, going back to the, to the situation, in the instance where, if, if it can be proved that that dress, uh, the infamous Gavin Raja dress, actually is exactly like mm -hmm. um, the, the British designer's dress, surely is, is that not? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll address the elephant in the room, who you call Gavin Raja, by the way. I hope everyone else picked up on that. She was calling Gavin Raja an elephant. But <laughs> no. uh, we'll move swiftly along. I think along. we all know what I meant. Um, you've been busted, Trudy. <laughs> um, no, I definitely think there should be ramifications because, you know, um, on the off chance that it's, it's a coincidence, it happens once. You know, lightning does not strike the same place three times in a row. And uh, this being the third occasion, and also the, the flagrant, flippant way that Gavin has been with, uh, with addressing the media to either clear his name or not, I think is already uh, a sign of guilt because, you know, an answer of, or, or a lack or an omission 
of an answer is almost proving a certain degree of guilt um, in himself. So I think now the onus is on the, the public to, to gain momentum to say, let's remove this person from, from showcasing and give other young designers an opportunity who are going to be fresh and original and who are hungry to prove themselves rather than uh, you know uh, somebody who would rather just copy paste designs from somebody else because I could give you 10 young designers who have the talents, the know-how, just lack the opportunity to showcase what they're doing. And I think um, more and more we need opportunities for, for young people because as great as the old vanguard of, uh, of the fashion weeks are, there's a time where you need to pass the baton. And I think um, things like uh, Fashion Week kind of close off a lot of doors because there's all of this bureaucratic stuff that has to happen before you can showcase. Whereas the, the fashion world and the internet and everything is moving so quickly that uh, I guarantee that if young people were given that opportunity, they could blow a lot of the designers that are showcasing currently at Joburg Fashion Week, Cape Town, SA, whichever one you want to, you, to showcase these young people could give them a run for the money. It's just the opportunity is not there. And I think more and more, perhaps we have to create our own Young Designers Fashion Week or whatever the case is, because we don't need uh, an AFI or whatever to showcase what we do, even if it's just an online fashion week that you showcase your stuff on the internet. Because the time is changing. Week. That would yeah. be intriguing. <laughs> Aaron, what are people saying online? <laughs> well, I mean, the whole Gavin Raja dress thing has just been huge on social media. And uh, I'm trying to get a, a hashtag going, which is fashion fraud. Is it fashion fraud or isn't it? You know, is it inspired design or is it literally copying and pasting? And I have to say that most of the tweets that have, have been coming through on the topic tend to agree with what Anthony is saying. You know, they tend to be saying if you look at the image of the design from the British designer and you look at what was down the runway in Gavin Raja's show, they're, they're copy, you know, kind of cut and paste copies of one another. It's not inspiration, it's literally fraud. That's what people are saying on social media. We have approached Gavin Raja and offered him right of reply, and we are hoping that he'll he'll come on board on ENCA Live. Um, but in, in terms of that whole debate, in terms of that issue, um, the the response on social media has been has been pretty pretty uh, outspoken. And also because you can go back and find other examples of, of when similar questions have come up in terms in terms of his work. Hmm. I mean, I think also what um, Anthony was saying that these you know fashion weeks etc important platforms um, and that should be used with respect and also be made available to people with fresh ideas who uh, want to change, revolutionize the industry and, and we should be careful about who we back and, and, and who we support in, in such platforms. Perhaps we've been a little insular, so let's go back to the international space. Actually, what can we learn um, from other countries? And Lanza, I'm curious about other African countries particularly. Are you seeing their fashion scenes coming up when, when you travel? Are you seeing a, a burst of creativity from the rest of the continent? Um, most definitely, it's, it's, it's growing, you know. Um, and um, even the international um, um, you know, market is now starting to look at what we have as, 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 as Africans because it's fresh, it's something that they don't have. And actually, we also should use that as, you know, as our weapon. And um, because, you know, it, it, I'll always go back to music. Um, you know, when you, when you um, not being original and African and, you know, true to yourself um, in terms of music, you you basically are saying you want to compete with the Americans or the Europeans um, with their own kind of music and they will always beat you at it because for them that's their origin you know so we need to start um, also just being proud of our you know our our African clothes our African fabrics our African designs and take those and go compete with those with the world I mean if you make a um, you know, a, 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 a good quality um, dress. You can stand besides any designer, you know, overseas on the red carpet, wherever, um, 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 and still shine, you know, be on the, on the same level as them, but having your own um, signature, African signature. So mm. that's also very important. So being authentic um, yes, to, to, yes. to your roots and expressing that. And that's that. one way of breaking the international market, just be 
um, be true to yourself and be, re be original. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I was reading an article about International Fashion Weeks also looking to diversify. Um, so coming to, to South Africa and, and trying to look for new artists that they can take to London, New York, because of course they will be offering something that's new and different um, to those markets. And it would be a pity if then someone goes there and tries to copy or just bring whatever's already um, on, on that platform. Um, so number... So Nabila, sorry, earlier on you were talking about manufacturing and, and just the value chain. And I often wonder, you know, sometimes people say we have the ideas and the design, but when it comes to actually manufacturing it, people always talk about quality, like local clothes are not the same quality um, as those manufactured elsewhere. What is, is, that, is that a genuine complaint and, and what's being done to change that? It is, a, to a particular degree, a genuine complaint in terms of, I will tell you that most of our designers and also our, um, you know, tailors that leave some of the institutions of learning, what comes across is that the main thing that they're looking at is your fashion week is getting into the magazine. They don't get into the behind the scene. What is happening behind the scene? Behind the scene is the manufacturing. Now, the craft then lack from that. Now, also, you find that our factories have been closing like a blink of an eye every now and again. Now, you find that if you've got a beautiful idea and a beautiful concept to get that in volumes, it's also a bottleneck to get it out there to be manufactured. For example, you, if you look at part of the products that we also do have locally, most of that are not manufactured. Then you find that they, your, your wool trues and all those mm. big guys, they have got the control in that particular space that at the end of the day, you must just only produce for consumers now and then nothing. Even themselves sometimes, they are very much keen in terms of utilizing new fresh ideas. If, you, if they go, internationally, in China, for example, anywhere for manufacturing. One of their cases is that if that particular product is in the country, now they can't have any other. If you come back and say, that's why you find that when you go back to them and say, this shirt is wrong, mm. therefore you can't get the same shirt. They will say, pick up anything on the floor. Yeah. Why is that? It's because that product, it came from, manufactured from China or from anywhere else. So now there's not, so manufacturing here at home is also a huge challenge in terms of creating a space for the emerging designers that wants to get into volumes, that wants to get into manufacturing more of their items is still a challenge. And that's why then most of the factories are closing on a day-to-day -day basis. So we need an industry that can produce volumes, that can produce that quality, and actually retailers are partly calling on that. Uh, it's just Very about so. ensuring that people take up um, that space, and, and of course we, we can talk uh, all day about the financing, etc. That, that well, we there that are also possible. the co-ops that are available now. One of the things that we are doing as well on our side, as an organization, we are building up the infrastructure of those particular co-ops so that at the end of the day like it's happening in japan in japan what they do is one is that during the era when we went there one of the things that they're doing all the components of the cars they do them in the within their villages now we want those villages those people as co-ops they must come up with the quality products which at the end of the day Nchanja, when he comes up with he with her own collection he can go back into that small chunk that she needs mm -hmm. at that point in time but she must be identify that those people are going to give her the quality that she deserves and that what she needs absolutely i'm gonna we run, we've run out of time this has been an, a beautiful discussion i'm gonna leave the last word um to you anthony partly as the blogger the trend master what should we be looking forward to um in terms of uh, going forward in, in the fashion and the creative scene in general uh, or what would you like to see um that that would tell you that south africa is hotting up we're, we're owning this cultural um terrain well, what you should be looking forward to or out for is me. No, I'm joking. <laughs> no. Um, what you need to be looking out for is young people. I mean, there's a lot of talented, uh, astute 
and driven young people. So just, yeah, support them in whatever they're trying to showcase, whether it's music or fashion or design, whatever the case may be. Um, yeah, look on the Tumblr, on the WordPress, on the blog spots, and give those people a voice and an opportunity when the work is of a very high standard instead of closing the doors, whereas the international people are the ones that are recognizing us. And I'll just like to remind young people themselves is be unique and be where you are from and bring the African voice to the world so that we can again bring the world back to Africa and, and really showcase, like we've all said, what we have to offer, which is very unique to where we're from. I see you've worked in your tagline for one of your sites into that, bringing I Africa to the world. <laughs> but it's an important point, uh, you know, as in Tlantla, emerging um, artist, um, Sonobile, also quite a veteran in this industry, have been saying, we have something to offer and we should ensure that we present our best authentic selves, be it in fashion, music, um, and art. Thank you so much uh, for staying with us. We will still, or well, certainly I and Erin will still be on social media to chat some more um, on hashtag ENCA Live. And we'll see you next Tuesday at 1.30 for our ENCA Live debate streamed online at enca.com. Thank you.